Okay, so outside we survey top down, inside generally survey top down, and I'd like to start in the loft space if we can. Um, so this is a traditionally built roof, uh, goes back really hundreds of years, uh, cut and pitch, so standard size timbers uh, that were bought into site and then a carpenter would uh, spend a couple of happy days cutting all these to, to size um, with plum cuts on the uh, on the ridge board, seat cuts and plum cuts over the bird's mouths to, to form the, the frame as we see it. Now I say it goes back hundreds of years, sawn timbers like this are probably only really from the late 1800s onwards. Prior to that you would get uh, rougher cut timbers and once you start going back into the 1700s sometimes you'll just get literally logs that, that make up roofs of older buildings um, and you'll see everything in between as well. So these cut and pitch roofs you can still get them built today particularly for bespoke properties uh, or complicated roofs. Um, most normal estate housing would be uh, truss rafters where we'd have trusses at normally about 600 millimeter centers. Um, the, the trusses with the, the two braces that come down and go back up are the most common now called Fink style. Um, but what we have here being cut and pitch is the rafters and the purlins and everything need to be sized suitable to the spans of which they're, they're being uh, subjected to. So first things first, we need to know about building terminology. So this fellow across the top here is the ridge board. That's about 150 by 25. Doesn't actually take any loading unless you've got a little complicated quirky detail in the roof, um, but that just acts as a rest from one side to the other. If we had um, a raised tie, a raised ceiling joist or something like that, um, and we wanted the ridge to be load bearing, it would be a substantial size timber, possibly even steel, but in most houses, it's just gonna be a, a small timber like that. You could literally cut the ridge board out and it wouldn't make any difference to the structure of the property. Um, then we've got our rafters. These are the old four by two size, slightly less than that actually. They're not, they're not quite two inches. Looks to be about 38 mil. Oh, they are 38 mil, so 38 by 102 was a standard size. So 102 by 38, um, so that's a, what, inch and a half, I guess. Um, and these bear down onto a purlin, which, which runs through the property here, and then onto a wall plate right the way down at low level there. And then the wall plate, um, off the wall plate, we have our ceiling joists that, that run from here front to back. Um, they take the, uh, the ceiling linings from the underside. And then we've got this timber here, Charlie, this here is called a binder, and because our ceiling joists would technically be overspanned, a binder's put in there to take a lot of the, uh, the spread out, a lot of the bounce out of the ceiling joist, um, which means we can have smaller timbers. Now, the, the purl in here is supported on uh, struts. These struts aren't doing a, a, a great deal of work because they're at, uh, less than 45 degrees, so the, the loading is still wanting to, to push down slightly. And then right behind me, we have this collar cross tie. So the only shape that cannot be distorted is a triangle. And what we're trying to do in any roof space or any structure actually is create triangles if we can. So if ever you see trusses in, in, in the roof space or even on the back of a lorry, you'll see they're basically broke up into a series of triangles. So nothing can then be distorted. So what we've got here, we've got one big triangle for the roof. But if we only had the one big triangle, our rafters would be spanning quite some distance. Um, they'll be spanning around around 3.3 meters, which is way over span for these. So the collars put in the middle, uh, sorry, the, uh, the purlins popped in the middle. Um, and then the collars then provide another triangle here and the collars help prevent the roof spreading out. So we've got our, our rafters that support the main roof load. They load jointly onto each other at ridge level. So if the roof was taken away on one side, it will collapse, take away on the back, it will collapse. So they, they're literally just in balance at the top. Then they load onto the purlins both sides, and then they load onto the ceiling, uh, the, the wall plate at, at, at low level. Um, the collar cross ties prevent lateral spread occurring, and the um, ceiling joist would also should be fixed, nailed to the collar, uh, the rafters, which again will prevent um, lateral spread from occurring. Now the purlin, um, the, the rafters that are around 38 or, or inch and a half, two inches by, by a, uh, four inches, the old size, um, they should span up to about 2.4 metres. Um, if any of you have got um, the Pocket Surveying Buildings book um, by Malcolm Hollis, it's absolutely brilliant. It's got some basic um, span tables in there, which is in, invaluable to have. 
um, particularly early on in your career. So for students, that is a brilliant book to get. Um, these these are actually spanning from the ridge down to the uh, to the uh, purlin of 1.7 meters. So that that's well within their their design span. However, what we do have as a little bit of an issue is the purlin is 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 undersized. Now the purlin is two inches by six. That looks to be in old money because it was built in old money. So yeah, 150 by by 50. Now that's probably got a design span of about 1.8 meters, but we can see the span is a lot more than that. It's about two and a half, and over there it's probably three meters. Now Charlie, if you can turn around and, and move your camera over towards the purlin, look, you can see there's a bit of a bow in it. It's not significant. Um, but timber work does have a habit of settling over the first few years of its life. Um, and that, is, that really is because the purlin is slightly underspanned. This strut we can see that's right next to Charlie here. This is a, a much steeper angle. So that's, that's probably about a 55, 60 degree angle. So that's actually doing a bit of work, that strut. But this one over here that we mentioned earlier is at way too, too lower angle. Um, so that's the roof structure. What we're looking at up here as well is we're looking at the underlay. So on the underlay, we can see this is uh, what we call an IF felt, just a typical Sarkin felt, really, really common. And you'd see this in vast, vast majority of roof spaces uh, that were built in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and into the 90s really, and still we started uh, getting breathable membranes taken over. So we've got our laps there, they form the quick, quick way around. Um, you want at least 150 mil of lap there to prevent any wind-driven rain coming up underneath. Um, and that's generally fair condition, can't really grumble about that. We've got uh, our ventilation that we saw outside is not brilliant. Ideally, those ventilation strips would, would come right the way down the soffits. They'll be on both sides of the property and they will provide a good flow of fresh air over the insulation. The insulation of which is, is not great. It's, uh, it's, it's thicker in places. So here we've got probably about 150, maybe 200 mil of mineral quill insulation. But just over there, Charlie, if you can turn around and show that over there, um, we're probably only about you know, 75 millimetres of insulation here, so um, it's not great. So we would really want this to be about three, 300 millimetres-ish, um, which wouldn't be difficult to achieve. We just put 150 or 200 mil over the other way, and then we've got a really good thermal lid to the property. When we're doing that, we just need to make sure that down in the eaves that we maintain any, uh, any air gap. And you can get these proprietary plastic things that you slip, slide down in there and then you can stuff the insulation to the underside of it. And what that does is that maintains a, a good, good level of uh, ventilation over that. So all in all, not too bad. But if we go over here to the entrance of the, actually just grab my damn meter, go over to here to the entrance of the roof. On the way up into the roof space, I did notice there was a bit of a bit of woodworm. <clears throat> So um, I'm just going to camp out over here for a second. It's not, the, it's not the tallest of roofs, so it's a bit of a squeeze. In fact, I might get back down on the ladder a little bit before coming back up in here. Um, so actually, if you pass me the camera, Charlie. So what we've got here, sorry about the thumbprints. Sorry about thumbprints being in the way, but we can see there's, there's actually a little bit of evidence of some woodworm in there at some stage. Now we can determine if that's active. We can pop something over that bit of tissue or something, preferably with a PVA glue to it. And then if we get any frass comes through, we can, uh, we can conclude that it's active woodworm. You can see, I think that's a tiny little bit of frass just down there. Which is basically the boar dust from the, uh, from the woodworm doesn't need treating per se, um, just creating a good, well ventilated loft is normally enough to, uh, to discourage any woodworm. The only other issue we've got up here is um, bait stations. There's a few of these and as Charlie, I'm going to hand this back to Charlie, he'll also show you a, an expired friend. There we go. So the, the, the owners have had a, uh, a rat issue up here and they've tried their best to deal with it. So I wouldn't be at all surprised if we were to take some of this insulation out, we would find other bodies underneath. So on my way out the roof space, there's just another couple of uh, semi-interesting things and critical things I wanted to show you. Uh, first of all is this binder. You can see there's a vertical mark on the binder and then there's a little tick next to it. And on the next one, and on the next one, and it's on all of these. 
So we can't, well the carbon is done, it's gone long, done the uh, the upright line there and then put a little tick as to which side of the um, the line that the joists are going to go to make sure that everything's set out properly. So a little bit of additional information, but quite critical, I said earlier about our rat infestation issue. Here look, we can see how they've been properly munching through some cables. We actually have bare flex there. So that's dangerous, that's a potential fire risk. Um, that needs to be highlighted to the client um, and that needs to be dealt with. Now, the issue with that is if that's there, it could be there, it could be there, it could be there, it could be there. So that's something that really does need to be looked at. I really am on my way out the roof now, but I've just noticed this on my way down the ladder. Here's an old, old newspapers. Now, oddly enough, newspapers can be, not always, but they can be quite an accurate way of dating a building. Now, we seem from the outside that we think this is 60s stroke 70s. Now, if we look at the newspaper, the date, December 1969. So this newspaper was probably popped up here by the builders when they were doing the work. Insulation, perhaps, if they were putting it in at the time, straight over the uh, newspaper. And it stayed there ever since. So possibly date this house to 1969. So in the garage of this property, uh, the garage external walls are, and the internal walls are flattened brickwork, um, common brickwork. The ceiling is only boarded with what's a fibre board, so it doesn't really provide much fire protection to the main house. And there's also uh, no fire protection to loft access hatch either. When we was up in the roof, we could actually see some daylight which from the underside we can see is coming through these joints around the perimeter. So uh, fire protection from the garage to the house isn't, isn't brilliant. Okay, so now we're inside the property. We've looked at the external. Again, I've done that top down um, and we started in the roof space. So now we're going to look through the various internal elements of the building. I'll do most of it in one room because it's going to kind of be the same in the other rooms as well. So we'll start with the ceiling. Uh, we can see from upstairs in the loft it is a plasterboard ceiling but we can see it's got stippled Artex finish on it. Now, many years ago, when Artex was used regularly, quite often a handful of asbestos fibers was thrown into the Artex to act as a binder. So there is a possibility that the, uh, the Artex does contain asbestos. Um, if you consider products like uh, AIB, asbestos insulating board, uh, asbestos cement, as an homogeneous material, it's produced in a factory and the fiber content is gonna be fairly consistent all throughout the material. Uh, when loose fibres were thrown in, um, it's non-homogeneous, so you could get asbestos fibres there, but not over there, and not over there. So if you had an asbestos testing done, they would knock some of these little ridges off, but they'd do it in four or five locations throughout the room, so that if there is a concentration of asbestos fibres somewhere, um, but not somewhere else, then, um, then it would pick up on that. Uh, other than that, ceilings are noticed to be in fair condition uh, throughout the house generally. There is a little bit of staining up there. Uh, that to me is indicative of uh, condensation. And if we look above the wardrobe, um, uh, the ceiling to the wall over the wardrobes, we can see there's a couple of dark stains there. Um, that's not water ingress. What I think up there is we've got a couple of areas where the insulation is, is not complete in the roof space. So it's pulling air up through a little cold spot, which is resulting in condensation occurring. If we also look to the front of the property here as well, we can see that there's, uh, there's some condensation up here and in this corner of the property. Um, heat producing rooms and moisture producing rooms like the kitchen, the bathrooms, if they don't have adequate uh, in, uh, ventilation, then the, the warm moist air generally migrates to the colder rooms of the house. Um, and here we are on the southwest facing corner of the property. Prevailing wind's going to come in from that location, and uh, which is why we've got a bit of a condensation issue there. Okay, walls, uh, we've already uh, looked outside and said earlier, I think the walls I said were 290 thick, uh, which is 100 uh, mil uh, um, brickwork, 100 mil block work, internal plaster finishes. So we're looking at a cavity of around you know, 70, 80 millimeters or so. Um, and again, as we saw outside, that has been uh, injected with insulation. Uh, walls are generally okay condition, um, no real significant issues. Come across little things like this, like this crack up here. That is really just a joint in the plasterboard. Um, outside, solid masonry. Inside, stud work, stud work. Um, there's going to be a timber line that goes up there. So whoever's fitted this will put a sheet of plasterboard there. There'll be a joint in that bit of plasterboard and they'll filled it over. The way around that, if you're ever tacking a new house or doing some repairs, is to cut your first sheet of plasterboard 
to go round. So you've got a big L-shaped sheet, uh, sheet um, then, then you won't get any cracking that occurs there because that is kind of a, a weak point. On to joinery. So at most houses we've got a painted timber window board. Um, absolutely fine, you know, this, this, this will be solid pine. Uh, nowadays the, um, the uh, tendency is to go for um, MDF, but, but solid timber was the, uh, the old kind of normal way of doing it. We've got in here, we've got like a pencil rounded skirting at low level. Uh, this is a, what was that, three inch skirting? It would be if, uh, by the time we take off the carpet. Uh, so again, quite, quite basic, but nothing wrong with that at all. And then around the doors, we've got a pencil rounded architrave. The doors themselves, six panel, so it's Georgian. If it's four panel, it'll be called Victorian. And then we've just got some, um, some brass door furniture there. Uh, door's not particularly well hung. There's a reasonably consistent gap up that side, uh, not so much across the top. The doors are not original to the property, so they have been, uh, have been refitted at, and replaced at some point. Okay, if we go into the kitchen, um, we've got a bit of a dated kitchen. Probably best stand over there for the missionary. Uh, we've got some drawer units uh, and some wall units, not in any particular order. Um, an old ha access hatch with plate glass. Um, Again, don't like plate glass, that should have a film on it really. Um, not gonna slam shut because it's fixed shut anyway, but it's just, just not great. Um, bit dated, so uh, the new owner's gonna, gonna wanna replace this, no doubt. Uh, but by blocking that up, we can put, I mean, why would you have a little gap like that there? It's, it's just a little bit bizarre, um, but it could be done properly. Um, could even perhaps knock it in with the living room and have one big L-shaped room. If we swap positions, Charlie, um, over this side, the kitchen kind of gets a little bit worse. Um, we've got very old, uh, these units don't even have backs to them. They're just kind of shelves with doors on really. Um, bit shabby, I must say a bit. Um, here, the bottom of that one's just completely gone. It's, it's, it's blown up, so not great, but it's um, okay, kitchen size. So rip the kitchen out, pop a new one in, and, uh, and all is good in the world. When we're outside, we can see the air bricks that are around the property, and that's to ventilate the subfloor void. Um, the floors, it's got a laminate finish to it, but the actual floor structure is timber. If we, we can feel the, the hollowness of the timber floor. So what we're looking at in our inspection is to go to some of the corners of the rooms and see if there's any spring, any issues or anything like that. And we've done this in all the rooms, and it's, it's pretty sound, so we know there's no, there's no issues with the floor in here. Um, as I say, it is a, uh, is a laminate floor um, and it's got this Scotia bead. Uh, Scotia is concave. If it was convex, it would be a, uh, a quadrant. Um, but that is because this is being fitted after the skirting. Um, if you was doing this from new, you'd put the flooring down and then put the skirting down on top of it and you wouldn't need a bead there. The only purpose of that bead is to hide the expansion gap, which should always be put around a timber floor because it will expand and contract slightly. Okay, so in the bathroom, uh, next step we're going to have a look at the sanitary wear. We've got a vanity basin, we've got a close couple WC, and we've got a plastic bath with an electric over bath Myra shower. So we'll start with the basin, Armitage Shanks inset basin with hot and cold taps. Wrong way around, hot's normally on that side, cold's normally on that side. And I believe the, uh, the idea of that is if anyone that was blind was to touch it, they'd always known to go to the left because it's hot. Uh, the vanity unit itself is, is a bit old and shabby, like the doors, um, not really, uh, not really fitted anymore. It looks a bit manky, but the uh, if we get down underneath here, we can see we've got isolation valves for our hot and cold feed to the basin, and we've also got electrical um, cross bonding. So if in the unlikely event that some of this pipe work should become live, uh, where our little friends up in the roof have gnawed through a bit and it's fallen over and touched a pipe, um, it's, it's earth. So it takes that takes that current straight to earth outside. Um, but this really is. Uh, it's just for replacement and that's it. On our toilet, we've got a uh, fairly basic, but nothing wrong with it, uh, closed couple toilet. We've got our overflow coming in that side and our water supply is up around the back. So we we'll always would we'll check around the toilet, see if there's any evidence of a leak or anything like that. All looks good. We can pop the cistern off because they're quite easy to do. And then we've got our, this is our float, this is our valve, that's our float. And this collectively is called the cistern. So when, when we flush, I'll do it because it's a bit noisy. When we flush, 
the, um, the, the float drops, opens up a valve which fills the toilet. There we go. <clears throat> and if that does overflow, it goes down or overflow in the corner, um, so it doesn't actually overflow into the property. Okay, our bath, um, plastic bath, again, that's actually quite a nice size tub. Um, tiled side, so if you ever need to do anything to it, you've got to disturb all this tiling. Um, hot and cold on a mixer tap, nothing wrong with that. They've got a grab rail, which is indicative perhaps of the person that lived here before. And then we've got a fairly basic Myra over bath shower. Uh, it's an electric shower, I believe, which means we've got one cold pipe coming in, a flash boiler inside, and then hot water comes out. And then we've got an isolator up here for it. Um, and this was on our, that's actually live. That was on our uh, 40 mil breaker that we saw in the garage. And then a fairly basic pull round curtain. Uh, there's no privacy in this bathroom at all. Quite often you'd have the same um, ironmongery throughout the house, but in the bathroom you'd have a, a lock um, that would have a thumb turn on the inside. So a little uh, bolt comes out there and then it's got a little slice in it on the outside, it's called overridable. So if something was in here and anything happened, you can put a tempi in it and undo the lock. <clears throat> Okay, on to services. We're going to look at electrics and, and gas um, because we're in the garage. So we've got our, this is our main service head for our electrics. It's coming up on the side wall of the garage. Uh, the other opposite side of this wall is a bedroom, and that's our meter. Now the consumer unit has been changed relatively recently. Uh, it looks a modern style, but we can see that that was actually replaced um, only two years ago, which is, uh, which is not too bad. Um, and it's all fully labelled up. Some of the circuits have been switched off. But um, the lighting alarm board has all been turned off, but the garage has been uh, remained on, which is why they're red. So 32 amps are normal for uh, power. Uh, and then we've got 16 for probably an isolator socket there. And where we've got small supplies like lighting and the boiler is all on, uh, is all on 16 amp. And the 40 is for the shower, because there'll be quite a bit of demand coming through that. Okay. The NICIC do actually recommend that electrical installations are checked every 10 years on a domestic installation or when a property changes hands. Um, it's for our client to make a view. We would recommend, obviously, um, that it's still tested, particularly what we've just seen up in the roof space with the, uh, the rats gnawing through, pipe, uh, through cables. Okay, also in the garage, we've got our gas supply. So our gas supply is coming in from outside into the meter and then back down into the house. Uh, so it's nice and easily accessible. Okay, back onto services, and uh, we're starting with the boiler. Now our gas supply is located in the garage, but the boiler is located in this little outside store. It's a combination boiler. They will always have a pull-down thing on the front, and there we go. We've got uh, controllers for our hot water, our heating, and a basic programmer. Uh, fairly basic, but they generally work. As long as you've got a smallish household, um, here we've got one bathroom and a base uh, sink in the kitchen. That, that's generally okay. But if you used to have three or four bathrooms, then a boiler, a uh, combi boiler wouldn't be good enough. Um, pipe work underneath. I might get this in a bit of a muddle, but you'll get the idea. We will have gas supply in, cold water supply in, hot supply out, and then heating flow and return. And then that will be our condensation pipe for the, um, for the condensate waste from the boiler. Um, if we look outside, We've then got our fan assisted flue up at high level, and this is our quite elaborate actually. Normally, if it's just in uh, 22 mil, this is a 32 mil waste that's been put in for the uh, the condensate, and that is our pressure relief. So that's all the parts of the, the boiler and the immediate controls. Heat output in the property is via these radiators. So they are pressed steel radiators with um, with grills on the top. All of them being fitted with thermostatic radiator valves and our normal lock shield rad valves. So these will enable pretty much room by room control of the heating installation, but it does need to be tested. It's, it's in a fairly manky condition. Um, whether these actually work or not, I don't know. We'd need the whole of the, the heating installation to be fired up, tested, and, uh, and see where we're at with it. So we're all done on today's inspection. Charlie in the background just collapsing the ladder up. Our final part of our inspection is we will go around and we would, um, what would we do? We would shut and undo every door, um, just a final little check on how they open and a 
think I mentioned one of these earlier that's just not, not that great. We would close all the windows, uh, we'll make sure we left the house absolutely as we found the property. Um, if it was occupied and we picked up keys, we would just leave a little thank you card. Um, this is a, I think it's a probate. Um, so on this one, we just got to drop the keys back to the agent and we'll go. So I hope you've enjoyed it. Thank you for getting this far through the inspection, uh, through the video. And uh, we'd be grateful if you could uh, like and subscribe. Thank you very much.